hello. Welcome to Gospel Lady Ministries again. My name is Sharon Durrett. I would like to begin by giving you our contact information. And that is Gospel Lady or Sharon Durrett at P.O. Box 380719, Sacramento, California, 95838. The telephone numbers are 916-224-7719 and 916-482-1057. The email address is gospelladytv at sbcglobal.net. That's G-O-S-P-E-L-L-A-D-Y-T-V at sbcglobal.net. If you would like to be on the email mailing list to receive our newsletter that comes out twice a month, Please email me or call or write and let me know and I'll be glad to add you to the list. There are many people around the country that receive the newsletter and partake of this ministry. I share a few things about the TV program as we're progressing little by little. And we have prayer requests. We have answers to prayer that are shared. Sometimes I'll write an article or share scriptures. And some people also I will get a a really good article from somebody. If you have something that you want to share with somebody in the newsletter, well, feel free to email it to me. And as the Lord directs, sometimes I've got a half a dozen, and as He directs, then I put them into the newsletter. Sometimes just an expert excerpt from it, and other times the whole thing if it's not too long. And if it's from a ministry, then that contact information is put in there. Uh, unless you give me permission to remove it because it's all about the Word and about the Lord not about promoting somebody else's ministry but for those that have an ongoing ministry that really you know have a good teaching ministry I will contact you and I will inquire into your ministry and if the Lord says I will, I will include that information too because this is not the only Word ministry out there and I like to give people the opportunity to contact you also. And uh, on Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock, we have Bible Study Fellowship. And is held at 10 o'clock on Saturday mornings at 2515 Cottage Way in Sacramento. That's on the corner of Fulton and Cottage. And it is at the Sacramento Evangelistic Center. The pastor is Robert Jones, and he kindly gives us the use of his church to hold our meetings here on Saturday morning. And I don't normally recommend churches because I believe that this is something that the Lord needs to lead each person in. But I also believe that when you find a church that is uplifting Jesus and really loves the people, that it's good to recommend them because sometimes people just don't know where to go and maybe they are not in a position to really ask God because they're not sure yet. That takes time and experience. But the whole congregation there is so sweet and so loving and the teaching is good. The pastor, well, in 35 years I've never called anybody my pastor or referred to him as my pastor. Not because I'm rebellious, but because I'm very particular who I say can be my pastor. Jesus Christ is my Lord, my Sovereign, my God, my teacher, my pastor. But as a pastor of a church that I attend, I gladly claim Robert Jones as the man in that position. God is always above him, and if he were to mess up, I wouldn't listen to him. But he's a good pastor, very good minister. And I think that you would really be blessed if you drop in and then leave it between you and God if you return. But you know, when you find a good water and hole, you don't need to go look for another. Well, God bless you on that. Now let's get into the Word. Chapter 6 of Matthew, beginning at verse 5. I use the King James. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues, and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. 
and thy Father which is seeth thee in secret shall reward thee openly. I very rarely ever pray publicly. When I was doing pastoring for a short stint, uh, I would say, when I get up on the pulpit, Lord bless your people, give us understanding, and then I would do whatever God said. But um, I'm just not into public praying because of this scripture. I want my heart to be pure before God and know that I am not trying to call attention to myself. And people say, oh, you pray so good. Well, I just call on God. And I don't want to be known for my prayers. I just want to be obedient to God. And if I'm going to be out there, oh, hallelujah, Father God, Father God this and Father God that, and well, I think that's for people that don't really yet understand the scripture. I find no fault with them. I just say that they are in error and that they're missing a tremendous blessing. And the people that follow this kind of example are missing a tremendous blessing. It doesn't mean you have to be afraid to pray if you're in a group of sincere believers. But you be in a prayer group and people, you'll have this one voice raise up above the other and they put on quite a show and God doesn't applaud. And I refuse to do things like that. If somebody comes to me and asks me for prayer, I don't sit there and hide afraid to speak out. I will speak out because God works through your audible prayers too. But to make a public display of prayer and people that go and they make a march on the White House or in this business or that business and they go up their nail on the street and say, we have the freedom to pray and we're going to pray. We're overcomers in Christ. We're defenders of the gospel. They are so deceived. We're not supposed to be doing that. Listen to the word. They are making the image of Christ look very muddy. They're not being heard by the Father. He hears them and he sees them, but he's wagging his hand saying, oh, when are they going to grow up? So let's avoid those kind of things. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be ye not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him doesn't mean you shouldn't ask him. It means he knows what you need. And he wants us to pray because he wants a personal communication with us. And prayer is not getting God to do something for you. Prayer is submitting your heart to God to accept his will. Because when you pray and you don't get answers to your prayers, it's because the motive in your heart was wrong. You prayed amiss. It was something that you just had to have or somebody you just had to control. And you're praying for God to deliver your habits that you have no intention of giving up. He's got to hypnotize you and blindfold you and gag you and tie you down to get a habit away from you or a sin away from you. God doesn't work that way. It's called pray, repent, submit yourself to God, and ask Him to help you change. And He'll do that through the Word and through the Spirit. It ain't going to work any other way. So you're praying amiss, so you might as well listen to the Word. Humble yourself before God and learn to pray and build a communication and a relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me, please. He says, After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Meaning you're acknowledging that God is our Father. His dwelling place is in heaven. It's a, it's a spiritual kingdom. It's not something you can see with your eyes. And that He is absolutely holy. And we're to even consider His name holy. And not come in so casually, disrespectfully. So many people come in, whether it's in a home meeting, which I love, or whether it's in a church, any place you come in to talk to God, you kick back, you fold your foot one upon the other, and you lean back and get a cup of coffee and say, Oh, Holy Father, this and that, you know. You might as well say, Hey, drop a chair, Jesus, and have a beer. Now, I don't believe in this stiff formality, but we treat businessmen better than we do the Almighty God. So let's show Him more respect. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. 
This world is never going to conform to the image of God. It's eventually going to be destroyed. But in the earth, in the kingdom of God, in this earth, us, in my life, let the will of God be done as perfectly for those that will do the will of God as it is in heaven. There's no sin in heaven. There should be no sin in us. If we will seek the Father with all of our heart, and if we will humble our hearts, repent of our sins, turn from our wicked ways, and seek the righteousness of God, and live holy, and commune with Him. We're the friends of God if we do what He says. We're not going to mistreat our friends. Not real friends. If we're a real friend, we are not going to mistreat our friends. Why would we mistreat our friendship with God? And believe me, we do it all the time. And His will is not done in the lives of people who follow after this pattern. Give us this day our daily bread. Oh, look at that new Dodge Charger. I just know by faith that God's going to give me everything I ask for. But he tells us not to lay up our treasures here because where our treasures are is where our heart's going to be. We're supposed to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then he will add the needful things to us and, you know, he'll even throw in some extra blessings now and then. But so often I've been speaking with other people or they call me for prayer request or in church, the prayer request you hear. Pray for so-and-so to be healed. Pray for this car that I really need. Well, if you really have a need, it's okay to ask for prayer. But who needs a $40,000 car? I'm sorry. That's a desire. Oh, God will give you the desires of your heart, not when they're lustful, not when they're greedy, not when they're excessive. So check your heart. God doesn't mind if you drive a nice car, even a $40,000 car, but make sure your heart is right. Make sure you're living for him and don't be asking amiss. He's not interested in filling your lust or your greed. But he is interested in giving you your daily bread, which first of all, Jesus Christ is the bread of life, which is the living word. That's the most important thing, and that's what he's talking about. And of course, he will give you daily food, which is also considered meat or bread. But you don't have to have steak and lobster every day. I mean, you know, go out for your birthday or something, that's great. He doesn't mind. But when you've got to have this highfalutin stuff and you have a fit, if somebody sets peanut butter jar on your table, you just highfalutin yourself right out of God's presence. What you've got, you give thanks for, bless it, and you eat it. He's not going to give you nothing bad or wormy. And if you be content with what you got, maybe you get a steak sometime. But don't be so fleshly, carnally minded, using God as a sugar daddy. You know what a sugar daddy is? He's a sucker. God is no sucker. And he's not interested in us climbing upon his lap, so to speak. Hallelujah, Lord, we love you so much. You come into church and the first thing you do is start singing and clapping and praising God and pretending the Holy Spirit's anointing you when he isn't. Because he wants you to be clean to come into his presence. He wants you to come into his presence. He's with you all the time. But with praises and thanksgiving. But not if you've got sin hanging all over you. I will not let anybody come to my table that is filthy, dirty, and stinking. Would you? Nuh uh. You tell me, hey, honey, there's a hose out there you can hose down if you don't have a sink. Okay, you go in the bathroom, wash yourself up. At least wash your face and hands and shake some of the guck off of your clothes. You don't come sit like that at my table. You make everybody around you sick, and I get sick just looking at you. That's the way God feels about the people that come into the church or a meeting or even all by themselves by their bedroom on their knees. Hallelujah, I love you so much, Father God. I worship you and I praise you. And they won't let go of that filthy sin that they're hanging on to. And God is so sick of that. So 
So if you want your daily bread, and if you want the blessings of God, and you want God's will done, and you get shed of your sins, honey, so you can be pure when you come in, and then you can say, thank you so much. I appreciate you, and I love you. But if you've got sin that you know is sin, now we've got secret sins and hidden sins that we ask God to reveal so we can repent. But honey, you know if you're living in adultery, nobody's got to tell you you're not that dumb. You know if you're stealing something that doesn't belong to you. You know if you're lying. You know if you're cheating. I mean, you know, some of us not too intelligent. But you're not that dumb. We're born in the knowledge of good and evil. We know right from wrong. Some people need to be taught certain things, yeah, but I mean, even a baby knows. He'd be creeping around, looking around, seeing a mama's there while he's getting into stuff he's not supposed to get into. And the minute she shows her face, oh, just the best little baby in the whole wide world. Don't turn your back on him. Because that child knows what he's not supposed to do, knows what no, no, honey means. And you sneak behind your back and do it a lot of times because they need to be trained. We're no different. Just because we've got bigger bodies, we're supposed to be smarter. Sometimes I wonder about that. But we're supposed to say no to what is wrong and yes to that which is right in the eyes of God. You can't say, well, it's okay. You know, uh, you got to try before you buy. We're going to live together for a while and see if we're compatible. And then uh, if we make it, uh, there are no trial marriages. Not in God's sight. You lay with somebody, you become one with them, you better stick it out and make a marriage of it. And if there's abuse on one side or the other to the point the other one can't tolerate, get rid of them, but don't go find yourself another and quit fishing. We expect God to give us our daily bread and all the desires of our heart, and we're so messed up and filthy. And the churches teach the very first thing that you do is go in there and start worshiping and praising God. That is backwards. You got your clothes on, wrong side out. You come in, you hear the word, and you repent, you get cleansed, and then you have something to thank God for. Because you feel a rejoicing and you feel gratitude that you are no longer bound by sin, headed for hell. When I'm doing something, which thank God I don't think I am, but if I were doing something that I knew was making me hell-bound and God stops me and says, look at what you're doing. Now you can choose to continue on with this or you can choose to repent, which means change, let go of it and do right. And I'll bless you and reward you with eternal life. I'm so thankful that he stops me when I'm going the wrong way and even the slightest little thing. And I praise him and I worship him for that because that's him showing me my, his love for me. Because he corrects me because he loves me. He doesn't want to see me be, be destroyed. And sin will destroy anybody. You lose your eternal life. You go to eternal damnation out of the presence of God forever and you can't be recovered. These silly people that teach about the, fir the foolish virgins and the wise virgins that the foolish virgins are going to be forgiven and enter in anyway, they don't know God. They don't know the scriptures and they're misusing them to make excuses for sin for folks that aren't going to make it in. You've got to walk it and talk it and live it. Don't be foolish. You take that daily bread, that word daily that God gives you. It says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Your debts is a debt of sin to God. And when people go cross grain to you, you need to forgive them. That doesn't mean you've got to go kiss and hug and slobber all over them and say, oh, honey, it's all right. Didn't mean to hurt your feelings when I told you didn't like what you were doing. No, that's foolishness. Love is not a gooey, sticky mess. Not the love of God. He says, I forgive you, just like he told the woman that was taken in adultery and they threw him at her feet. Whoops, excuse me, threw her at his feet. And he says, after saying, okay, who is um, among you that is without sin? You can throw the first rock, go ahead. Everybody dropped the rocks and took off. He says, woman, where are your accusers? She says, well, there aren't any. 
He says, I don't condemn you either. Go on. But don't do it again. Sin no more. He'd forgiven her. He'd cleansed her. We owe that debt of sin. But Jesus paid for it. And we're clear and free in him. If we repent, which means to stop it. And do right. And when you don't forgive other people, you're harboring anger and hatred and judgment and criticism and condemnation in your heart towards someone else. And you know what, honey? That's sin. So you say, Father, you work it out. I'm not going to let that anger eat me up. The devil likes to get you angry at somebody and make you feel all bad about them, say and do things bad to them and about them. You think you're getting even though you're not. You're destroying yourself and they don't hear what you're saying anyway. They really don't care. In fact, it makes them happy that you're miserable. So why stay miserable? Just say, Father, forgive him. I forgive him. I'm not going to let it bother me anymore. You're God. You can fix it. I can't. And if you don't fix it, well, I'm just going to leave it alone anyway and go on with my daily life. So forgive people. And he says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Look at the next couple of verses. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now that word trespasses can be translated as sin. It can be if you break a law. Okay, so you're not supposed to shoot anybody. And you get in a tussle and you shoot somebody. You broke the law, you're going to go to jail, you're going to pay for it. The Lord says, I'll forgive your sin. You may have to go to jail and pay for what you did according to the laws of the land. But he says, I forgive you and I will not hold that sin against you that will keep you from inheriting eternal life. If you will repent and have a godly sorrow for which you are truly sorry for what you've done, that you have taken another life, and there is room in the kingdom of God. There is room at the cross for you. And although it may not be as deep-seated as taking another human life, when you do something injurious to someone else or you do something that you have sinned against God, you can come and you can say, Father, please forgive me. I have done a terrible thing and I can't seem to forgive myself. But I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins. I believe He is your only begotten Son. I believe that His blood pays for my sins. I believe that you will give me your spirit if I will believe in you, trust in you, follow after you, and that you will save me and give me eternal life. Let me do whatever I can to make this up and use me as a witness and a testimony even though I have done great harm. Please forgive me. And your God is so gracious, He will. He will forgive you. He turned your whole life and heart and mind and soul around. And His grace and His mercy will cover you. Now, He may not bail you out of prison when you've done something really bad, but He'll use you while you're in there. And when you get out, if you do, your life will be better because you won't be going back to the old way of life if you walk with God. But part of that is forgiving other people that had done you wrong, even if it's great wrong. And so you have to forgive other people, whatever they do. If somebody has something that they have done terrible against you, the devil had a hold on them. They're accountable, they're responsible, but they need Jesus. They need God in their life. God doesn't want to send them to hell. He wants very much to forgive them. He wants them to come in and repent and accept His love. So, therefore, if you retain anger against someone else, you're just eating up your own spirit, your own soul. You've got to forgive them. Leave them in God's hands. It doesn't mean you have to buddy with them, but it means you're willing to forgive them and not try to go after them. So have a repentant heart, and please realize that the Lord wants you to learn all these things so that you know how to walk with Him so He can bless you. He's your Father. That is, if you've been born again, if you're not, accept Him and He will be. 
But he loves you enough that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus the Christ, to live as a man, show us the way, to suffer, to give his life, to be buried, rose again, showing he had the power over everything, including life and death. He is the creator. He is God. He's the master. And you need to live holy. So please, read the word, study the word, live the word, love the word, and walk in God's love. And it's time to close now. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, before you go, I do want to again remind you of the Bible study on Saturday at 10 o'clock at 2515 Cottage Way in Sacramento. Our phone numbers again are 916-224-7719 and 916-482-1057. Please contact us. We would love to hear from you. I'll pray for you. You pray for me. God bless you.